Join me and welcome our speaker tonight, Tom Triumph. Thank you. <laughs> Here are two true, absolutely true stories about two different people. And I know which person you're going to want to be. These stories start out pretty much the same. But over the course of their life, one of these people turns their life and finishes their life as a multi-billionaire with a capital B. The other person who started out similarly steers his life into financial destitution. Adolf Merkel was born into a wealthy German family. And he was smart. He had a great business acumen. He took over his father's modest pharmaceutical distribution business. And he drove that business. And he built it into the largest financial wholesaler in the entire country of Germany. And he, wasn't stop, he didn't stop there. He then founded what became Germany's largest pharmaceutical generic drug manufacturer. He also invested in construction businesses. He also invested in material businesses. He became one of the fifth wealthiest people in Germany. He had $13 billion. In 2008, some poorly timed financial decisions on his part resulted in a decrease of his value from 13 billion down to 9 billion. This loss was very unsettling to Adolf. And after spending Christmas with his family, two weeks later, he threw himself in front of a train and took his own life. At the time, he was still one of the top 100 wealthiest people in the entire world. Chuck Feeney, a guy from New York, was a student just like many of you. And he and a college buddy of his decided that they would start a business selling products to soldiers, most of them in Asia, going back and forth to Asia. If you've been in an airport, you've probably seen his Stores, you've probably been in his stores. They're the duty-free shops. You guys familiar with those? Chuck Feeney, despite having a global business, is still a very humble, modest guy. He always flies in economy class. He's never owned a car, and he lives in an apartment. Chuck's idea of dining out is going to Tommy O'Malane's on 57th Street, New York City, an Irish pub, and having a hamburger with friends. Chuck Feeney's worth is $8 billion. A number of years ago, Chuck decided he was going to give his entire fortune away. And that's what he did. Last year, in 2017, he finished it up. He gave away $8 billion. And he did it anonymously. Time Magazine and Forbes Magazine called Chuck Feeney the James Bond of philanthropy. Because he's so secretive and he's so successful. So think about this. You've got two people. One person has $9 billion and he kills himself. The other person has $8 billion and he gave it all away. Right? There's many, many things I, I don't know, but, but, but I know this. I think Chuck Feeney had the right thing in mind. John Lennon, who I really liked, the musician and uh, Beatle, singer-songwriter, when he was five years old, his mother said, happiness is the key to life. And then when John was in grade school, maybe second or third grade, his teachers gave an assignment to define what it is they wanted to be when they grow up. To which John replied, happy. When his teacher said, well, John, you don't understand the assignment. 
And a very precocious John Lennon said, you don't understand life. So here's what I'm going to do today. I have an hour, and I want to jam it full of stuff. I want to defer questions. You can interrupt me, but I'm not going to carve out like 10 questions at the end to talk. I'll stay here out in the lobby as late as you want. I've got some things for you to take away. So that's my plan. I want to give you guys as much as I can, candidly and honestly, what I've learned in 35 plus years of working. And this, by the way, is a picture of Chuck Feeney. My talk is on the call to innovate. You know the world is changing. It's a very different world. When I graduated college in 1980, typically you would get a job. You might get a promotion after a few years, and maybe another one a few years later. Maybe after a dozen years, 10 years, eight years, you'd switch companies, you'd go to another company. After 30 some years, you'd retire, and you'd have worked for maybe two, three different companies. Totally different world today. Look at all these lovely NC State students. The recent Bureau of Labor Statistics says that the average American is in their job how long? 4.2 years. That skews to about half that for younger folks like yourself. Think about it. That's like 20 different jobs you're going to have in your career. And when I say different jobs, don't fool yourself and think they're going to be like the same job but at a different place. <laughs> Nobody's going to hire you to do the same job in a different place pretty much. When you get promoted, as you grow, you're going to be doing entirely new things. Just a few years ago, a third of the workforce was involved in some sort of moonlighting. When I was young, when I was your age, I didn't know anybody that did consulting. In just a couple more years, that's going to change the half the population. And people are concerned, and rightly so, about a jobless future. Gartner, a very reputable research firm, says that 30% of our jobs are going to be displaced in just several more years. And that's just not blue collar jobs. By the way, 3.5 million truck drivers on the roads today in the United States. But it's not just blue collar and factory workers. It's white collar. And it's not just white collar. It's professionals like lawyers and doctors. And it's not just professionals, but it's creative. Make yourself a note. Check out Emily Howell. Emily Howell composes symphonic music. She's a machine. And her music is indistinguishable from that composed by humans. Check out E. David. That's a robot who's learned through machine learning how to paint. I want to get to know you guys a little bit before I tell you about myself. This is a game called Stand Up If. Stand up if you're an NC State student. Stand up if your education is in technology or science, one of the STEMs. Wow. Stand up if your education is in business or admin or communications or something. I love it. Stand up if you grew outside of North Carolina. Stand up if you speak two or more languages. Very impressive. Stand up if someday you might, look at you, stood up, if you might want to go to Mars someday. Stand up if you love music. All right. Love it. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about me. I grew up reading Tom Swift books, building clunky robots and homemade submarines. I've had the good fortune to have been involved in what in hindsight were two true global technology revolutions. I've worked for Fortune 100 companies and many small startups. I was involved in less invasive surgery when Procedures went from being done for something like a simple appendix with a seven inch incision, which by the way, you'd be in a hospital for several days and you'd be out of work for several weeks. It was all done less invasively with instruments like this. It changed, it transformed medicine in about a year. Today when you get your appendix out, you walk in that morning, you walk home 
that afternoon and you go to work the next day. The other techn technology revolution I was involved with was the internet and enterprise software. This is what I thought my life would be like when I was your age. This is, this is what I aspired to. You guys all recognize this, right? I was Michael J. Fox's age at the time, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd grow up to be like this guy. This is, I built several submarines and underwater habitats when I was uh, a kid. This is one I built in high school. I want to point out the sophistication of this, of this machine. If you notice the front hemispherical shape, that is the top of a Weber barbecue grill. This photograph is very rare because truthfully, just minutes after taking this photograph, this submarine was pulled out into the middle of the lake where it immediately sank unintentionally to the bottom and I wasn't able to recover it until like five days later. But I learned a lot along the way. I learned the importance of working with other people and not trying to do everything on your own. Mr. Tate mentioned the hovercraft I built. Here's a video of it here. This is um, about 70 feet long. It can carry 60 people and it can go over 60 knots and it flies three feet off the ground, so we could fly over everybody here. It can go over a wa water five miles deep, or water one inch deep, or land, like you just saw it go over. And when I say I've done a lot of products and have been involved in some cool things, these are two of the coolest things I've been involved with. These are my uh, two kids. Uh, my daughter just got married this uh, fall, last fall. She's almost 30, and my son is uh, about, about your age, actually. He's 23. So I have a lot of experience, and not being falsely modest. When I say experience, I do mean what Oscar Wilde said is simply what we give our mistakes. And I've certainly made a lot of mistakes. I want to quickly go through the forces driving change, and then I want to talk about the forces resisting change. And then I want to give you guys a dozen what I call rules, new rules for succeeding in this new world. And I'm kind of apologize up front, but I got so much I want to share, I want to just blast through this stuff with you guys. So what are the forces driving change? Technology. Here's one example. The first human genome that was decoded took 2.7 billion dollars and took 15 years. In 2002, it cost 100 million. In 2008, it cost 10 million. Last year, well, in 2012, it was 1 million. Last year, it cost $1,000. They think by 2020, you can decode anybody's human genome for less than the price of coffee. Another major driver of change is communication. Today alone, I was on a video call, right? We use Hangouts, but you can use, uh, you know, Skype, of course, and uh, whatever. You know, uh, we use, what else, uh, uh, WebEx and something called Blue Jeans. But I was with, on with folks from India, with Argentina, with Mexico, and in numer numerous places across the, uh, the country. Another big change is globalization. And globalization, of course, is really essentially the world getting smaller because of what I talked about previously, communication and technology. It really started in the mid-1800s with the telegraph and the steamship, but it's continuing to happen. Education. Man, I love, I love all the stuff that's available now to, to continue learning, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with Khan Academy, maybe when you're in grade school or high school, but there's Udemy and Udacity and Coursera, so many places to get an uh, education. These guys virtually are, are pioneers, fathers of artificial intelligence. Sebastian Thrun runs the um, um, uh, autonomous vehicle program, as does Peter Norvig, and they teach the artificial intelligence class online for free. So whatever it is you want to learn, there's no excuse for not learning it. 
And you know, my talk, I'm glad I remembered, I want to say this. My talk kind of focuses on technology, because that's my background, but it doesn't need to be about technology. If you're in communications, you want to be a better speaker. If you're a chess player, you want to be a better chess master. If you're an athlete, you want to be a better athlete. There's so much information out there. There's no excuse not to continue getting better. Another driver is mobility. Don't have to talk about that, you guys know. But this lets anybody in the sub-Saharan Africa have virtually access to the same information as you do. And population shifts. Uh, let me see if I can remember a, a statistic of population shifts. It doesn't just mean necessarily people moving uh, geographically. Here, here's one. About four years ago, 1% of the population had 43% of the wealth. And in just a couple more years, in less than 10 years, a total of nine years, it's going to change that 1% of the population is going to have 50% of the wealth. So that's another big shift, what I mean by population shifting. Here's the forces resisting change. And honestly, it's important to be aware of these because we all have them. This is a big one. You know, what, what, what do you think about, about yourself? What do you think about your world? What do you think about your potential and your capabilities? Let me give you an example of this. When I click this, watch this cat, and then I have a question for you. Here's my question. How many people saw the cat spinning this way? Raise your hand. How many people saw the cat spinning the other way, like this? All right, watch it again. Same thing? All right. Here's the thing. You can't tell which way the cat's spinning. If you look at it, you can trick your mind to get it spinning both ways. Because it's like if I was a silhouette, you can't tell which arm is in front of the other. So when it starts, you don't know if the cat's like this, and his little paws go that way, or you don't know if he's like this, and his paws, you know, come out the other way. So it's how, whenever you start seeing it, that's how you're going to consistently see it over and over again. And to me, this is a good example of people's beliefs. That's why you can have people that have exactly opposite views of things that to you are so obvious, but someone else can think something different, right? Think politics, for example. OK, another force resisting change is your self-perception. What do you think about yourself? Another one is rigidity. I'm going to give you an example of rigidity. Do you guys know how ice was made and delivered to your homes before there was ice manufacturing? How do you think? Come on, you got not a quiet group. They cut it out of lakes. They cut it out of lakes. Like this. This was a big business involved tens of thousands of very cold people. And obviously they were limited because it had to be near a lake. And then they'd, you know, in the winter time, whenever there was ice, this is what they would do. And then automation machinery came along, technology came along, and they had ice factories, right? Maybe this is ice 2.0. And then they make the ice in a factory and they deliver it to homes. And then what happened? And then they miniaturized this stuff and they came up with cool orange ice boxes and refrigerators like we all have. Here's what's interesting. None of the companies that did this, and there were hundreds, and none of the companies that did this, and there were hundreds, transitioned to the next venture. They were all new businesses. Okay, That's what I mean by rigidity. Knowledge, obviously so important. What you know is key to where you're going to go. And this may catch you by surprise, uh, but ego. There's a great book, which I recommend. It's called uh, Ego is the Enemy. And I can't remember who the author is. When I think about it, I'll let you know. But it's a very good book. Don't let your ego uh, block you from your continued growth. Do you guys know who these people are? Any rock and rollers in here? 
You don't know who this is? That's Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. He was in a band before that called Nirvana, right, with Kurt Cobain. Smells like teen spirit. This is the drummer from Foo Fighters, William Goldsmith. They were making their second album, and they were big. Foo Fighters were blowing up. And David Grohl, who, as I said, although he plays guitar and sings, he's the front man for Foo Fighters, he was a drummer for Nirvana when Cobain was a singer. And on their second Foo Fighters album, he wasn't really happy with the drumming. He's a very aggressive drummer, if you've ever seen him drum. So he took over and he did some of the drumming. And this pissed off Michael Goldberg so much. It hurt him so much. He says he felt like he was attacked. He said worse things, which I won't quote. You can use your imagination. So what did he do? He said, screw it. He left the band. And Foo Fighters went on to tour the world and win Grammy after Grammy. And what happened to William Gold Goldberg? Well, he developed an alcohol and a drug dependency for decades, right? Because of ego. What he should have done, it's easy to say in hindsight, he should have just said, you know what? That's fine, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna learn the kind of drumming you want. I'm gonna learn to be a better drummer. I'm gonna drum my ass off, and I'm gonna grow with this band. All right, so let's talk about a path forward, right? We know the world's changing. We know there's things driving change, driving innovation. We know there's things that resist innovation. Let's talk about a path forward. Businessman and Virgin King Richard Branson started Virgin in 1970. He was a dyslexic, poorly performing student. His teacher said, Richard, you're either going to be in jail or you're going to be a millionaire. Guess how many Virgin, how many different Virgin companies there are today? What do you think? Throw out a guess. 40. How many? 40. 440 different Virgin companies. Boxer Manny Pacquiao rose from very humble beginnings to become arguably one of the greatest athletes in the world. He's the only boxer to have won 10 world championships in eight different divisions. And he's been elected to the Philippine House of Representatives. The band U2 started out covering bad Ramon songs. Or I should say covering Ramon songs badly. And they practiced in a very small kitchen in a very small home in one of their parents. But for whatever reason, these guys told themselves, they were high school kids, they told themselves, you know what, man, I think we could be, I think we could be the best band in the world someday. They've won 23 Grammys. Their lead singer, Bono, has been knighted by the Queen of England and nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, whose physical mobility was limited to the ability to twitch a single cheek muscle, nonetheless revolutionized the world's understanding of the universe, no less, how it originated in the Big Bang. So the question is, how did these people attain mastery, attain excellence in their lives? Well, I've studied them, and I've studied literally hundreds of others. I'm on my way to a 1,000. And I want to share with you what I've distilled down into how they did it. Right? So these are what I call the rules to rule your new world. Number one, keep learning. Keep learning. Maybe... Maybe you never thought about it. Maybe you thought like, you know, you go to high school, you go, then you go to college. Parents are so proud. Some of you going to graduate school. Some get a PhD, but, you know. But I'm going to tell you something. And you, you will remember a long time ago, in 2018, somebody told you, it, it never ends. It never ends. I mean, I am studying and learning as much as I did ever. I wasn't that good of a student, so, you know, it's not too hard for me. I wish I was a better student. Um, if you're not learning every day, if you're not learning every week, then there's somebody who is. And they're coming after you. Okay, if you want your life to be better, I'm telling you, you're going to be learning every day. I like using positive stories, but this is a negative story. This is a woman named Renee. And Renee lives in Indianapolis, Indiana. Renee works at the carrier plant. Carrier makes big air conditioning units. 
and Carrier was moving some of their jobs, manufacturing jobs, down to Mexico. You may remember this. This was all in the news a while ago. So Carrier said, hey, we are going to help you guys and, and women transition. We're going to train you a technical school. If you want to go to a four-year school and get a degree, we're going to pay for that. We're going to reimburse you're going to school for four years. And Renee says, man, I don't want to do that. Like, I want my $18 an hour job. I've been doing it for 20 years. And, and, and no criticism. This sounds like no criticism. She is just comfortable in her trailer. And that's fine. But here, and here's what she said. At my age, 41, I don't have the confidence to start all over again. And you better, you better develop the confidence to start all over again. And I know that's counterintuitive when you're young and you're getting out of school. But, man, you better constantly be in re reinventing yourselves because we're in for a lot of change. Second, little things matter. Now, please don't go quiet on me. I want to see some ideas as to what this means. Anybody? Investment return. Investment return. That's a great guess. One more guess. Yes. Tiny step forward each day leads to a large gain. I love it. Tiny step forward leads to a large gain. Here's what it is. If you start with one of something and you change it by just 1% a day for a year, that one, just 1% a day, and by the way, 1%, you can't even see or tell what's going on at 1%. In a year, the one goes to 38. And if you start with one of something, and you chip away at it micro, micro, 1% less a day, 1% less. You don't even know if it's 1% less. That's how small it is. In a year, that 1 goes to 0 0.03. That's a pretty profound difference. That's, a, that's what 1% can do. That's how easy it is to attain success. That's how easy it is to attain success. And that's also how easy it is to fail. Because it's easy not to do it. You know, it's easy not to do the 1%. Surround yourself with good people. I love this quote by Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Surround yourself with good people. And by the way, the people you should be surrounding yourself with, maybe, I don't know, maybe, they may not be <laughs> your friends now. And it may not even be your family. And nothing against your friends or your families, but, you know, people like want people to be like them, right? And if you ever want to experience this, try, try you know, doing something as simple as going on a diet. You'd be like, come on, man. I mean, it's, you know, one day, one slice of pizza. Or try skipping a, a game to do some homework. I mean, you'll be like the weirdo. Like, come on, man. It's the big game. Study later. These are two folks that I really massively respect. Uh, when I built the hovercraft, it was for a guy named Francesco Musaferiti. They called him Moose. Frank was a Naval Academy graduate. Uh, he just died. There's a gentleman in the middle there. He just died. But I, I love the guy really like a, like a father. Um, I have so many stories about Frank. But he was just a great guy. He started his business when he was 56 years old. And he ground through it. And we would go on business trips, maybe to India or Saudi Arabia. It's very brutal traveling back from there. I mean, it's exhausting. And we'd come back, we'd land at Newark Airport, maybe at 4 in the morning. Frank would go home and shower and be the first one in the office the morning at 6.30 working. And he was a CEO and chairman. He's worth about $200 million. He never stopped working. The person on the far right is uh, John Scully, who was CEO of Pepsi and CEO of Apple. Set big goals. I don't have a lot to talk about this, but I hope you guys are setting big goals for yourself. I hope you write your big goals down. More importantly, make a roadmap. Now, a roadmap's a little different than a to-do list, right? A roadmap is actually thinking about how it is you want to get there. So I'll talk to someone like Claire, and she'll say, you know, what do you want to do? Well, I want to, I want to be a published poet, okay? Well, how do you go up being a published poet? 
start writing a little bit every day, start going on Amazon, finding about self-publishing, start joining, you know, poet groups, whatever. I mean, make a plan. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, we all make to-do lists. Here's something else that's also a little counterintuitive. Consider making a not-to-do list, <laughs> right? Because it's easy to waste time. Innovate. Yeah, try, try new things. I want to make a point about two different types of innovation. And if you remember, this, it, this is just the way the world is. This will be applicable the rest of your life. A, a, and these two types of innovation are, are, are both relevant, but they're kind of at odds with each other. One is sustaining innovation. And sustaining innovation is, you know, I got the, Apple, the iPhone 6. I got the iPhone 7. I got the iPhone 7S. I got the iPhone 8. I got the 8 large, you know, all that stuff, which you have to do so you don't fall behind Samsung, right? In this case, innovation might have been, hey, don't rewind your videotapes, your VHS tapes, just bring them back. We have a machine, we'll rewind them for you. All right. The other kind of inno inno uh, innovation is disruptive innovation. And this meets future needs, right? One is like taxi cabs, the other is like, Uber. So by the way, Redbox went to um, Blockbuster and said, hey man, we got this idea. You, you want to buy it? And they're like, no. <laughs> we have a lot of stores. We have way more videos in our stores than you can have in your, in your little machines. So just a few years ago, Red Bo uh, Blockbuster, of course, shuttered their doors. Guess what this is? What? Digital camera. First digital camera. 1974. 1974. It took uh, 26 seconds to make an image. And the image, when you're done, looked like a ghost. Guess who invented the digital camera? Kodak. Kodak was huge. Kodak was like Apple when I was a kid. Kodak ruled cameras. Now, film, film and cameras, right? So imagine you show this to Kodak. Like, hey, look what I invented in the lab. Like, man, that is crap. Like, first of all, we're in film. And look at the clarity, the quality of our images. And what you made is, like, hilarious. Well, luckily, Kodak patented it. And that's what allowed Kodak to survive. They just filed bankruptcy. They're, they're, they're gone now, just a few years ago, because they were able to make money from their patents. But, but they're gone. So innovate. Try new things. Sounds like innovate, a little bit different. Try new things is just keep yourself fresh, man. Listen to different music. Find a new way to drive home, you know, or go to school one day, ride your bike, brush your teeth with your other hand, put your coat on instead of when you're right. Right arm first, put your left arm in first, mix it up, try new things. Don't waste time, I touched on this earlier. Work hard. I'm gonna give you an example uh, from my own life about working hard. Um, when I was in high school, I loved the, sp the sport of wrestling. I grew up in a small town in Indiana. And I worked very hard at wrestling. In fact, every day I would run six miles to school. Every day I ran six miles to school through the snow. And during wrestling season, I worked out three times a day. In the morning when I'd run, I'd work out at lunch, and then I'd wrestling practice, right? And I got pretty good. I, I actually was invited to wrestle in the Olympic trials when I was just in high school. No, no talent, just, just hard work. I drove with my coach in our small town of Indiana, up to the University of Wisconsin. I'd never been to a university before that I, that I remember. And it was in a field house, and I had never been in a building this big in my life. I mean, it was, it was overwhelming. There was lights, camera, and action. There was multiple mats and matches going on at the same time. What's more, the person I drew to wrestle at one point had just won, because this was like in May, 
He just won the NCAA championship. This guy was a monster to me in high school. This guy was out of college. This guy had a hairy chest. He had muscles on top of muscles. It was intimidating. But again, I'd worked hard. Now, I don't have a photograph of myself from the Olympic trials. But based on strength parameters, performance metrics, physical computer modeling, I have an image of myself back from then. <laughs> now, when the match started, I'll never forget, in his corner, on his side of the mat, warming him up, were two brothers, Ben and Dan Peterson. And Ben won gold in the Olympics, and his brother Dan won silver in the Olympics. And then four years later, the other brother won gold, and the other brother won silver. Warming up me on my side of the mat was my high school coach. And I'll never forget what he told me before I went out there to meet this guy, to start wrestling. He put his hand on my shoulder, and he looked me in the eye, and he said three words I'll never forget. He said, don't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and as I walked out there, I thought to myself, in milliseconds, I was thinking, you know, this guy's a monster, but I, nobody's worked harder than me. So, you know, I'm just going to do my best. And we shook hands, and everything seemed to go quiet. And I focused on this guy, and I saw his torso in front of me, and I just said, what the hell? I mean, and I just shot in for a takedown. Now, I do not remember a lot after that. <laughs> but I do know the final result. And if there's any doubt, I was the zero. And I told you that story because I wanted to get to my next point, which is keep improving, right? It's not enough just to work hard. Someone told me when I was about three years older than you guys in my first job, he just mentioned it kind of as an off-the-cuff comment, but for some reason I've never forgotten about it. He said, you can write your signature a million times, and the millionth time is going to look just like the first time unless you practice changing it, right? There's a gentleman named George Leonard. This may be another book you want to write down. He wrote a book called Mastery. George Leonard, a book called Mastery. In the book, he talks about archetypes to learning. There's four of them. I only want to share with you one, which is the path to mastery. Whether you're learning how to play the cello, whether you're learning how to be a better speaker or organic chemistry or playing chess or hit a better serve, this is the path to mastery. You start out with showing some improvement, and you think, Man, I may be pretty good at this. Like, I don't know, like I'm getting it. And then pretty soon you hit a plateau, and it may be weeks, it may be months, and you're working, but you're not getting any better. Stay with it. Work to improve yourself. Don't just keep working hard, but work to improve yourself on that edge between failure and success. Work on that edge, and eventually you'll hit another uh, spurt, growth spurt. I mean, it's, it's not sexy, it's not glamorous, but that's how people mature and grow and obtain mastery. I love this quote, don't fear the plateau. Right, today's world, everybody wants immediate success. Nobody wants to continue sucking. You have to suck for a long time, and you gotta keep working at it when people aren't even knowing you're working at it to hit to that next growth spurt. I love this quote, mastery, the patient, dedicated effort without attachment to that next growth spurt. All right, stay humble. I don't have a lot to say about this. Um, I, maybe it's self-explanatory, it's self but uh, I think it's important to remember uh, you're not that good, uh, no matter who you are. Um, and, and some of the best people I know and the most accomplished people I know are the humblest people I know. And the contrary, too. Some of the biggest tools I know uh, are that way, you know, for no reason, unjustifiably so. Enjoy life. I like this photograph. Um, it reminds me of a story my grandma told me when she was in her late 90s. Uh, by the way, this is a photograph of her. But she said when she looked out, and it's funny she told me this because it's, it's, it sounds like a made-up story, but it's true. When she looks out from her eyes, she still feels like a little girl. 
on her 99th birthday, I sent an email to a bunch of friends of mine, and I said, hey, if you guys will write my Grandma Susie a little letter wishing her a happy birthday, I'll make a donation to the American Cancer Society on your behalf. So my grandma started getting inundated, 99-year-old grandma started getting inundated with letters from all around the country and from the UK and from Canada and different parts in Europe. And it was unbelievable for her. A friend of mine at the time was the CEO of Mars Candy. This number of years ago it was where they were just starting to print, the, the, developing the capability to print individual stuff on the, on the M&Ms. So he printed, Happy Birthday, Grandma Susie. And, and I think he put her image on the other side and it sent her like 10 pounds of M&Ms. <laughs> a week or so later, my grandma took a fall, put her in a hospital. A week or two after that, she died. But she loved those letters so much. My uncle buried her with all the letters from all those strangers. And they used those candies as little takeaway gifts that bagged them up in little bags for everybody who came to her, uh, her, her funeral services. Now, where is Mr. Tate? All right. Thank you so much for organizing this. Do you remember when we were talking months ago uh, and you were telling me about the NC State students, you remember what you told me about them? Yeah, I said they were intelligent, they were very interactive. Yeah, intelligent, interactive, okay. What else? Remember you said? I said they rock. You said they rock, that's right. <laughs> well, I thought about that. I thought about that, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So let's begin with something you've all seen before. Despite the fact that there are billions of these, each one's actually entirely unique. Yet its character, its beauty, its singular magnificence is actually, for the most part, concealed inside as yet undiscovered. Subjected over time to a multitude of forces ranging from the very gentle to the more cataclysmic those forces shape and transform. Friction, pressure, strain can cause fractures, but they can also reveal previously unseen beauty and character that had been hidden inside as yet undiscovered. In fact, those forces are necessary to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. And that's basic geology. About six weeks ago, I went out in my backyard and I got a bunch of stones. Um, and, and from Umstead Park. You guys know Umstead Park? And I started them spinning. Six weeks ago. And here's what's crazy. They've been spinning in here continuously, 24 hours a day, for about six, six weeks. It's longer because this thing got delayed. And if you listen, you can hear the motor. But if you listen, you can actually hear the rocks tumbling around inside. So I can't wait to see what this looks like. I think this is going to be perhaps a bit of a mess. I want, uh, I might ask, will you come up and help me? Sure. Do you mind? All right, let me put this over here. Um, so let's, why don't you, why don't you op open that up, if you would, you just unscrew it. Oh, like that? Yeah. You know what? I don't know what that's going to, here. Do you mind? Okay. I mean, I, well, I don't know. It's been in there a long time. Fair. Yeah, you know what? Hold on. Just because I'm not, I'm really not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> okay? Okay. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want to open it? No, I want to stay away from it. <laughs> don't point it at them. Don't point it at them? Do I screw it or just pop it off? Okay. <laughs> 
Here, I really don't know. Go ahead, do that. Like a hot radiator or something. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> okay. So what do you think? Looks like a mess. Looks like a mess. <laughs> Will you? Can you hold this for me? I'm gonna. I'll dump it in there. Sure. Do you want your helmet? I think I'm okay. Please. And rinse them in there if we would. That is crazy. And I got another one here. Try this one too. That is unbelievable. Um, I don't know if you guys can see what they look like, but they're pretty much like like this. I'm going to, hold on, what's your name? Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you so much for not exploding things. Um, I hope, hopefully I got enough there for everybody. So you guys come up at the end and, um, and, and, and pick a rock for yourself. That is, that is awesome, that's cool. Wow. I've got, I've got two for me here that I like. Put these. In. Okay. So that got me thinking, right? Basic geology. You know, you rock. It got me thinking. And then I was thinking about something I call humanology. Right. So let's begin with something you've all seen before. Despite the fact that there are billions of these, each one's actually entirely unique. Yet its individual beauty, its character, its singular magnificence is actually, for the most part, concealed inside, as yet undiscovered. Subjected over time to a multitude of forces ranging from the very gentle to the more cataclysmic, those forces shape and transform. Friction, pressure, and strain can cause fractures. But they can also reveal character and beauty that previously had been unseen. In fact, those forces are necessary to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. It may seem counterintuitive, but do not wish for an easy life. An easy life does not provide the resistance to shape your lives into something truly meaningful, something beautiful, and something uniquely you. And you already know you can't fake it, right? Nobody would take one of these rocks, and I have some b before they got tumbled, and I'll put a picture on it and say, you know, hold it up as something remarkable. Nobody can do it for you. Just like physical resistance shapes our bodies physically, it's resistance that also shapes our minds mentally and emotionally. So the next time you are struggling with something at school, at home, in your personal life, as you get older in your work, just remember it's those difficulties and challenges, it's even those disasters and screw-ups that have the power to turn your life into something truly remarkable. I want to tell all of you that what's happening is truly a big deal. It's a big deal. And what I'm going to talk about is likely happening to many of you here. Maybe you, you, <laughs> great smile, you, you, gosh, many of you here, maybe all of you here. You've likely been aware of this for some time, but the world is calling you. This appeal likely began as your own private thoughts, faintly emerging, yet persistently urging. Your thinking started surging, your thoughts coalescing and converging. Over time, this appeal became more pronounced, almost like an entreaty announced. You began to feel like things were stagnating. Right? What used to seem good enough now seemed insufficient. You became attuned to those gaps between how things really are and how things actually could be. Now let's be clear about what's happening. You are being invited to step up and make your mark, to forge new methods, reinvent yourself, keep learning, and ignite new sparks. 
The world is calling you to innovate. And why this call to innovate, to keep improving? Well, we talked about several reasons here. For one, the world is changing in more ways more rapidly than ever before. Historically, our professional lives were neatly divided into two parts. First, we apprenticed and learned to trade. And then we spent our adult lives doing that work and never really strayed, no longer. Today, technological and societal changes abound, impacting nearly everyone around. Advancing ways of technology, robotics and AI, autonomous vehicles, e-commerce, delivery drones in the sky, hosted platforms, solutions, and 24-7 services to use, global communication power in the palm of your hand that lets you make the news if you choose. Moreover, you're aware of many problems in the world where real improvement is needed, yet those many problems go unheeded. And then mixed in with all this is this realization in your head that you, you think, yeah, maybe I could, as young as I am, maybe I could make some difference instead. Instead of the usual same old, same old, instead of the dread, instead of being a bystander and watching the world go by, maybe I can make a difference if I try. And those are the reasons creating the unease and awakening your sensibilities. Your better future demands it. Hearing the call, understanding what I'm saying, even a little bit of it means you're ready to begin. Heeding the call is entirely up to you. And for those of you that want to start and make tracks, let's begin by separating fiction from facts. Born an innovator, true or false? Innovators are made. They're not born in the wild. Creativity takes talent and skill, none of which you have as a child. And if you think you are average, you are in good company indeed. You're just like Albert Einstein, agreed? A flash of innovation. The final job, the final solution, will likely not come to you fully realized in a dream or in a flash of lightning or on a laser beam. Don't wait for lightning to strike. Don't wait for inspiration to feel smartest. Inspiration is for amateurs, says Chuck Close, the artist. The lone inventor, false. To put it front and center, Thomas Edison, the inventor, had over a thousand patents that he shared with 200 colleagues with whom he was paired. It's too hard and you're too busy. Fact or fiction? Actually, only you really know. It's your life. It's not his or hers or some random Joe's. But think about this. After a long day at work, Yvonne Brill would come home and put her kids to bed and then sit at the kitchen table and work into the nights. And eight years later, she patented a new rocket engine that powered the Apollo moon mission and satellite flights. You can't. Before you default to that position, you may want to give yourself a mission like Sabrina Potersky, who built all by herself from scratch a plane that she flew. And she was just 14. Now what about you? And then MIT and Harvard, she studied her way through. Now Sabrina is heralded as the next Einstein, and she's just 22. You tell you what you can and can't do. The big leap. Across some chasm, does innovation jump? Not really. It moves more like it's hitting a thousand speed bumps. The first wheels turned pottery in 3500 BC and then didn't roll chariots for three centuries. The printing press invented in 1409 was already antiquity in Gutenberg's time. And a thousand years before the Wright brothers' flights, monks built gliders that flew to great heights. Copy and combine. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Use everything around you to mix and match, steal and edit. Stand on the shoulder of giants. Give Isaac Newton the credit. Sarah Blakely took some old pantyhose and some scissors and made some cuts and built Spanx into a multi-billion dollar business and shaped a lot of butts. Begin right here, right now. Begin right here, right now. True. It's what Robert Rauschenberg did as a struggling young artist living in the New York City beat. Rauschenberg made art from discarded junk he found on the street. Find paper and paint it. Find a need and fill it. Find a hole and fill it. Find a problem and kill it. Everything matters. This is tricky. It's true. Some things do matter more and some things matter less. But here's my advice. Make the less about you and the more about success. It's why some furniture makers finish the underside of their tables. Right? It's why Frank Lloyd Wright designed overhanging gables. Why Steve Jobs insisted on nickel-plated screws inside the case of a Mac. Why recording the song Born to Run took 10 months back to back. Enjoy the journey. There's no evidence that going from point A all the way to point Z is accomplished any more effectively with an attitude of arrogance or a dour demeanor. So be kind, be happy, be pleasant. Be a gift to others when you're present. All right. Listen, we all know the world is changing rapidly, and there's a lot of work to do. I'm sorry, what's your name again? Caitlin. Caitlin. You are like a chess master moving your problems into chess checkmate. My friend in the jeans, a jean shirt, what's your name? Avishnu. Avishnu. You're going to be changing lives, man, like water changing state. You with the glasses. What's your name? No, in the purple. Angela. 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 You're like a boxer punching above her weight. My gentleman right in the middle there with the NC State, yes. Raj. Raj. Nice to meet you, Raj. Man, you are sending out energy like a satellite sending out an update. I thank you guys so much for inviting me out here. It's really been a pleasure. Please come up afterwards. Let's meet and talk. I guess we're going to go out there, get a rock. Also, I have something that I really suggest you guys all get. I got permission from the author to, to give it to the NC State students and faculty. It's a wonderful book. I can't say enough about it. Turning Pro. It's a wonderful book. He's written about 18 books, uh, one of which was turned into a movie, The Legend of Bagger Vance with Will Smith. But, but this is, a, this is a, a, a nonfiction book. It's a great book. So fill that out. Make sure I can read it, and I'll, I'll, I'll get the book to you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.